Hi there. So we're going to finish off this chapter, chapter 10, by talking about Bose-Einstein statistics. Um, first, though, remember that I said in an earlier lecture that Bose-Einstein statistics actually describe black bodies, which we covered in Modern Physics 1. To remind you from Modern Physics 1, black body radiation is the radiation that's emitted from an object purely because of its temperature and then a few of the surface properties like the emissivity. Okay, so a black body will emit radiation in sort of a continuous spectrum, um, but that spectrum has a characteristic shape in the intensity curve. At room temperature, black body radiators emit in mostly the infrared region, and then as your surface temperature increases, the wavelength changes, going to shorter and shorter wavelengths as you increase your temperature. Classically, it was difficult to understand why the black body curve had the shape it did, the Rayleigh genes law did the best it could, but ultimately classical physics failed at describing this very characteristic intensity curve for black body radiators. Notice here that um, as your temperature goes from 2000 Kelvin to 4000 Kelvin, the wavelength gets shorter and shorter, moving there to the left. What Max Planck did is he fit the curves and then it came up with a theory that best described why the curves act the way they do. To describe the theory, he had to assume that a solid was a collection of atoms kind of connected to one another by these little springs. And the springs only vibrated at very specific quantized frequencies. Okay, so this was a new idea and helped lead us into the quantum mechanics that we know and love today. But it's worth emphasizing that Planck did this. He derived this expression for a black body radiator's intensity curve without knowing anything about quantum mechanics or knowing anything about Bose-Einstein statistics, which weren't developed until much later. So here's our intensity curve. The intensity, which is a function here of the wavelength and the temperature, is equal to 2 pi hc squared lambda to the fifth over lambda to the fifth e to the hc over lambda kt minus 1. Okay? Now that e to the hc over lambda kt minus 1 bit, that should look like Here's the energy of our photon, hc over lambda. So that's actually e to the e over kt minus 1. Okay? And that should look somewhat familiar after the last two lectures because that's part of our Bose-Einstein um, statistics distribution function. Okay? So spoiler alert. All right, now first, in order to describe Bose-Einstein statistic for black body radiators, we have to develop an expression for a density of states. We can't use the one for a gas of particles that we've been using for the last several lectures because for black body statistics, you're actually generating a gas of photons. This is the light that gets emitted by a black body radiator. So that's not a particle per se, it's, um, it's a photon, and they have different kinds of expressions that govern them than do particles. So to do this, we're going to assume yet again that we're, we've got our photons, our black body, confined to a little cube, okay? The cube has sides length L. Now, wavelengths can exist inside the cube. Wavelengths of light can exist in the cube, but they have to form standing waves because they interfere with one another, and all other waves that don't have the wavelengths that form standing waves are going to cancel out. So the standing waves are going to form a half wavelength kind of value. So in your ground state, you'll have one half wavelength. In your first excited state, two half wavelengths, and so on and so forth going up from there. Okay. Now, the wavelengths that form dictate what the momentum of the light is. Remember, as we covered pretty extensively in Modern 1, light has momentum. Okay, now for waves, the energy of the wave is equal to PC. This is HC over lambda. E is equal to HC over lambda, where P is the momentum of the wave, which is H over lambda. Now we have a 3D problem, so we've got momenta in the X, Y, and Z directions. So our total momentum P is the square root of the sum of the squares of the momenta in the x, y, and z directions. So we have E is equal to C times the square root of PX squared plus PY squared plus PZ squared. So remembering that P is equal to H over lambda, and the wavelength for each dimension is restricted by the length of the box, if you look here, you've got one half wavelength confined in this box of side L. So that means that the wavelengths are actually going to be equal to 2L over N for each direction X, Y, and Z, okay? In other words, if it's in the ground state N equal to 1, then the total wavelength here is 2L. And then for the first excited state, 
you've got one full wavelength confined in the box and its wavelength would be L over 2. Hope you understand that and see it. But if you don't, go ahead and pause the video and take a second to make sure to really take that in. Okay, now plugging in for lambda um, equaling h over p, plugging in there and finding and solving for p in each dimension here, plugging those values in, you get e is equal to c times the square root of hn over 2l squared, and then summing that up for the x, y, and z directions. If I pull common factors out, um, then I have e is equal to hc over 2l times the square root of the sum of the squares for the quantum numbers in the x, y, and z directions, and x squared plus n, y squared plus n, z squared. If we use the idea that we developed in a previous lecture, that our quantum number n is equal to the square root of the nx squared plus ny squared plus nz squareds, then we can uh, solve and find that e is equal to hcn over 2l. Okay? So that's our energy expression, and it's different from the energy expression that we derive for the gas particles. But we're going to use the same kind of idea in that we're going to put this in phase space, okay? And the phase space here is going to be our energy level space, and then we're going to switch that over to energy with a change of variable in just a little bit. Remember that you can't have any negative values for your energy levels. They have to start at 1 and go up. And so that means that only one quadrant of the little sphere that's formed in phase space is going to be useful to us. So we're going to have one eighth of a sphere in energy level phase space. And we're just looking at a little slice of that sphere because we want to know what the density of states is, right? So the density of states is going to be this factor of 1 eighth and then times 1 over the volume because the density of states is energy per unit volume, so the volume's important there. And then we have our 4 pi n squared, that's the area of our sphere in phase space. And then to get the volume, we multiply that times dn, which would be the thickness of our spherical shell. Now this factor of 2 here is because there's two possible values for the spin of a photon. Remember in the gas of particles we had 2s plus 1 to account for the multiplicity of the spin states. But for a photon there's only two choices. It's either right circularly polarized or left circular, circularly polarized. And so that's that value of 2 that we put in right there. So this is our expression for the density of states in, our, in terms of our energy level n. Now, if we want to switch that over, we change variables from n to energy, just using the expressions relating the energy and the energy level that we derived earlier. Rearranging that, n is equal to 2LE over HC, and then dn is equal to 2LDE over HC. If I plug in for that value of n and dn into my expression for my density of states, then after a little bit of algebra, I get 8 pi e squared dE over HC cubed. And that's our density of states for a gas of photons, like a black body radiation type thing. Now, recalling our distribution functions, here's our Bose-Einstein one here for integer spin. Remember that photons can be considered to be particles of integer spin, all right? So what we're going to do is to get our numerical distribution function, we're going to multiply our volume times our density of states times that distribution function for Bose-Einstein statistics. We get then V 8 pi e squared over hc cubed 1 over e to the e over kt minus 1 dE. So that's our numerical density of states. Now if we want to relate that back to um, Planck's expression for the intensity, then we need to um, switch over and not look at the numerical density of states, the number of states, but we would need to look at the intensity of the emitted radiation. In order to do that, it's first best to switch over to the energy density because you can relate the energy density to the intensity by multiplying simply by C over 4. So if we switch over to the energy density, that's the energy per unit volume times the numerical distribution function. And then we have 8 pi e cubed over hc cubed 1 over e to the e, over the, e, to the e over kt minus 1 dE. Okay? And then we just multiply that by c over 4 and we integrate and there's our expression for our intensity. Okay? So way to go Planck, thinking of all of this stuff many, many years before quantum mechanics and before Bose-Einstein statistics, but um, way to go Bose-Einstein for realizing that you have this set of statistics that describes this and much more as it turns out. Now there's some really fun videos that I have posted um, underneath this video. It's a series of YouTube films made originally by um, Dr. Leitner in the 1960s.
and he ex um, explores and explains some of the really interesting properties of liquid helium. Now helium is a noble gas, so it interacts very weakly with itself, all right? Which explains or helps explain why it doesn't even become a liquid until such a low, low temperature, about 4 Kelvin. Remember that all the noble gases become uh, li liquids at low, low temperatures, but helium goes even lower than the others because it's so lightweight amongst other reasons. Now, if you cool liquid helium down even further towards what's called the critical point or the lambda point, it'll start to boil very violently as it gets close to that lambda point. And then once it reaches 2.17 Kelvin, that critical temperature, it goes perfectly still. And then you know that it's actually achieved a phase change and become what's known as a superfluid, all right? It's called the lambda point because if you measure the heat capacity and plot the heat capacity versus the temperature of helium, it actually makes a really cool lambda shape that you see here on this plot. So liquid helium at or below the lambda point exhibits interesting properties. Um, superfluids all do this. One of those really interesting properties is that it has a very, very close to zero viscosity, basically no viscosity. Remember that viscosity is an, a liquid's resistance to flow. So if you have a viscosity of zero, then the liquid basically has no resistance to flow at all. That means that the film can do really cool things like creep up over the edges of the container. Okay? It forms a very thin film and then creeps up over the edges and then drips down the bottom. Some of Dr. Leitner's videos show this very, very low viscosity fe um, feature of liquid helium. Now, Fritz London, in a paper in 1938, actually said that liquid helium below the lambda point is part superfluid and part normal, and that as your temperature gets lower and lower and lower and lower, which they weren't really able to do very well in 1938, so this is a pretty incredible prediction for him to make, actually, um, that the fraction of heliums in that superfluid state uh, changes as the expression 1 minus T over Tc, where Tc is the critical temperature, raised to the 3 halves power. So superfluid liquid helium, the, the part of liquid helium that's in the superfluid state is referred to as a Bose-Einstein condensate. Okay, you may have heard this expression in physics and kind of wondered what the heck they were talking about. All right, so Bose-Einstein condensates are all particles that are in the same quantum state. Bosons can do this because they have integer spin and are not subjected to the Pauli exclusion principle. So what happens in a Bose-Einstein condensate is all the particles fall into the same quantum state, which means, basically, if they're all in the same quantum state, they have perfect knowledge of every, every system, everything in the system. They all know where each other is. They're behaving basically as one. So the viscosity can actually go to zero because the particles don't collide with one another anymore. They're moving in perfect synchronization together, and that's one of the reasons that superfluids do what they do regarding the viscosity. Now, if this doesn't make you think of the Borg, you really need to watch a little bit more sci-fi, a little more Star Trek. You need to get into the nerdiness that you have joined by becoming a physics major. It's actually pretty enjoyable. All right. Now, liquid helium itself, there's only a few um, particles of helium that are in the helium-3 state. I should probably mention that there's a couple of isotopes that are naturally occurring for helium. Helium-3, which is two protons and a neutron, and then the much more common helium-4, which is two protons and two neutrons. Now, we mentioned that protons and neutrons are fermions, okay, which means that they're half integer spin. When you've got four particles of half integer spin, you can add up to a total spin that's an integer value. Okay, that's known as a composite boson. And so helium-4 is a composite boson. If you add all those spins up, it has an integer spin. But there's no way to do that with the much, much less common isotope helium-3. Now you can see the properties of Bose-Einstein condensates in liquid helium because not too many of the um, helium atoms are in the helium-3 isotope, a very small percentage, actually, a very small fraction. It's interesting to note, though, that helium-3, even though it is a fermion, will become a superfluid itself, but at a much lower temperature, about 2 millikelvin. And the way that it can do that is if two helium-3s pair up, okay, and then they add together to have a total integer spin. 
All right, so it becomes a composite, composite boson, if you will. So it's pretty interesting. All right, but back to the much less exciting statistics. We can use for helium and other Bose-Einstein condensates, they're particles. So we can use that density of state that we derived earlier for uh, a gas of particles. To remind you, that density of state was 2s plus 1, 4 pi, m to the 3 halves over h cubed times the square root of 2e divided by the volume. Okay? Now, if you remember, we multiply all these things together to get the numerical density of states, and then we have um, uh, the expression shown here. Now, in order to maximize the numerical density of states, um, what you want to do is you want to have a non-negative value of this expression as energy goes to zero. Because remember, for um, bosons, what you want is you want to collapse them all into that ground state and make the energy as low as possible. So the E equal to zero state is where it's at, where the interesting physics occurs. So if E is equal to zero, then that expression E to the E over KT, that's E to the zero, which is going to one. So if you look at the denominator of that fraction, then you'd have A minus one there. Your normalization constant needs to be selected, but you want a non-negative value. You want a non-negative value because no distribution function should have a negative value. That doesn't even make any sense to have a negative probability. Okay, so 1 is the lowest possible value that you can have for that normalization constant um, that will maximize your value of n. Okay, now if you do this, if you maximize that value of n, this is what happens when you reach your critical temperature, your Bose-Einstein condensate transition temperature. Okay, so if you integrate that expression that I had on the previous slide from zero to infinity and then solve for your expression, then you can um, divide through by the volume, you get n over v is equal to 2.612 times 2s plus 1 times 2 pi mktc, which is your critical temperature, divided by h squared raised to the 3 halves power. And then you can rearrange that and solve for your temperature. And if you do that, you get Tc is equal to n over v times 2.612 divided by 2s plus 1 to the 2 thirds power h squared over 2 pi mk. k here is Boltzmann's constant. And you can use that expression to solve for the critical temperature that something becomes a Bose-Einstein condensate at given a specific density. Now, in Bose-Einstein condensates, above that critical temperature, all the particles are basically in an excited state. But then once you reach that critical temperature, you undergo a phase change, and particles begin to drop down into that ground state where they can all coexist. It actually obeys the equation that London laid out in 1938 for the fraction of particles that are in that ground state given a temperature T. So this is why Bose-Einstein condensates are really, really hard to, to fully and totally observe, all right? Bose-Einstein condensates weren't observed in the laboratory until about 1995, and then the people that did it, there were two different groups uh, with three physicists working together, or working in competing but sort of competitive, happy collaboration. Um, and they all achieved Bose-Einstein condensation around the same time. So the three of them shared the uh, Nobel Prize for Physics in 2001 for, uh, for proving the existence of Bose-Einstein condensates. All right, well, I've posted a lot of videos for you to look at after this video. It shows, um, first of all, Leitner's exploration of superfluid helium, which is um, pretty awesome for the 1960s. And then after that, a couple of videos uh, explaining in sort of a more friendly way what a Bose-Einstein condensate is, and then showing how Bose-Einstein condensation can be achieved in laboratories now using sodium and materials like that. So be sure to watch all those videos. I hope you enjoyed it, and let me know if you have any other questions.